Hello and welcome to the Electoral Integrity Project's annual workshop, this year focusing on challenges of electoral integrity around the world. My name is Toby James and I'm the co-director of the Electoral Integrity Project alongside my colleague Holly Ann Garnett. And we're really, really excited to bring to you a very full packed schedule of nine academic panels, three practitioner panels, uh, and over 200 delegates from around the world who are combining their collective brains on how to improve, protect and strengthen electoral integrity. The workshop is supported by our partners, International IDEA, IFAS, the Carter Centre and this year the Journal of Electoral Studies as well. I'm really grateful to all of them for their support in making this event happen. Now, throughout the world there has been a concern that there is evidence of democratic backsliding. A summit for democracy was hosted at the end of last year by the United States in an attempt to set forth an affirmative agenda for democratic renewal and to tackle the greatest threats faced by democracies. But since then, we've seen the events unfold in Ukraine. We've seen democracy coalitions forming around the world, even in established democracies. We've seen the pandemic continuing to put pressures on democracies. And perhaps it is a wonder, therefore, we see cross-national data showing how autocratization seems to be going viral. What about elections? Now, elections are an absolutely essential part of democracy. They give citizens the opportunity to elect their representatives, hold governments to account, and shape policy making. So is it the case that we've also witnessed electoral backsliding, decreases in the quality and the fairness of elections? If so, where have we seen those declines? Which countries? Which parts of the electoral process and what about the success stories where has electoral integrity increased where have reforms and promises and commitments to electoral integrity been made by relevant governments what can be done to improve the quality of elections around the world these are the main questions and the main themes for this workshop this panel aims to kick off the conversation by continuing the tradition of bringing together leading practitioners, policy makers and academics together into one single room. And the panel will unfold as follows. To begin with, Holly Ann Garnett will give an overview of the latest uh, Global Electoral Integrity Report, mapping out trends and patterns in the quality of elections around the world. And the EIP data is available to everyone. You can download it from a website and you can use it to identify the strengths and the weaknesses in elections in any given country. We then are very fortunate to have Massimo Tomasali, International Ideas representative to the United Nations, who will speak about the Democracy Summit, but also the other global efforts that have been undertaken by the international community to try and forge consensus and action to strengthen and improve electoral integrity. Next, we have Samson Itudu, Chief, Exec Chief Executive of Oyaga Africa. And he will explain the work that his grassroots organization have undertaken in improving electoral integrity in Nigeria and other countries in Africa. And, how, and this really demonstrates how civil society can play a vitally important role in improving elections. Improving election integrity isn't something that has to come from above, from the international community, from organisations. It is very much needs to come from all of us, from citizens. Civil society has an absolutely crucial role to play here. Just a couple of quick words about housekeeping. Selected papers from this week will for a special issue of the Journal Electoral Studies and we'll be in touch with all the authors as soon as possible after the conference. We intend to record presentations, but we will seek permission before publishing them. Um, so please let us know if you do not want to be recorded and whether or not you're happy for your paper presentation to be put onto our YouTube channel. We also um, importantly have a, a very great tradition within the Electoral Integrity Project of papers and comments being presented in a collegial, supportive and positive spirit. We're, we're here to 
help each other to improve each other's research and improve our policies. Uh, and we thank you in advance for continuing that in this tradition. So without further ado, we now move to the main presentations. And in many senses, Holly and Garnet does not need too much of an introduction, but nonetheless, she is Associate Professor of Political Science at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston. She is cross-appointed faculty at Queen's University in Canada. And maybe more importantly, she's an honorary research fellow at the University of East Anglia here uh, in Norwich. So handing over to Holly, the floor is yours. All right, can I just get a quick thumbs up, Toby? You can see everything and you can hear everything. Yep, that's all great. Perfect, wonderful. Um, so yeah, so it's my pleasure to uh, kick off our conference with uh, some of the work that the Electoral Integrity Project is doing. Um, and to give some highlights from our most recent year in election report um, that just came out in the last month or so. So uh, let me just... Next screen. So just to give a, a bit of an overview of what the Electoral Integrity Project is, um, as many of you know, it started in uh, 2012 um, with Professor Pippa Norris at Harvard University and the University of Sydney. Um, since then, in uh, January 2021, it uh, transferred uh, leadership to myself and Toby James. So we're now at uh, in Kingston at Queen's University and Royal Military College and at, in the UK at University of East Anglia. Um, and from its inception, the Electoral Integrity Project has aimed to respond to three major questions. How and when do elections fail throughout the electoral cycle? So elections are not just what happens on election day, but an entire cycle of activities. What are the consequences of these failed elections? That could be for things such as security, accessibility, public trust, all very important outcomes for elections. And what can be done to mitigate these problems based on the academic evidence that we are able to provide and through our partnerships with um, international organizations. And so who we are, um, you've met my Toby now, you've met myself, you've probably spoken on email with Madison, our project coordinator, um, but we are not just the three of us. Uh, we are a team uh, that includes research assistants, uh, 33 members of our uh, international advisory board. This past year, we had 15 fellows, which included junior fellows, practitioner fellows, and senior fellows. Um, so these are some of the faces uh, that make up the EIP. And we also have a, a great new program with Emory University where we have interns coming in with them. Um, and so we are quite a team. And then if you include all of the alumni of, of different fellowships the EIP has provided, um, there's, there's many, many people who have had some contact with the EIP and been part of the team in some way. And we're excited to have you all now as part of that team as well. What do we do? Uh, we do focus on uh, four main pillars, data collection, um, of course, the flagship perception of electoral integrity index, but other data collection projects as well, um, doing research and especially finding ways to disseminate that research to the practitioner community, training, including the fellowships program that we mentioned earlier, um, opportunities for early career researchers and working with a variety of, um, of practitioners to provide bespoke consultations. And then network building. And that's part of what we're doing here today and this week is the annual workshop um, and seminar series uh, podcast and other sorts of ways that we can build a network of scholars and practitioners who are very keen to improve the quality of elections around the globe. So to get into maybe the meat of the presentation, the first question we always get asked is, well, what is electoral integrity? Um, and there's a variety of different ways that we can seek out to define it and to measure it. Um, I won't go through kind of the history of the concept, um, but where uh, we are right now is largely looking at um, democratic theory and what really needs to be required of an election in order to fulfill what we expect an election to do um, to, for a democracy. And so we've come up with about five major principles that we expect to see um, for elections. Opportunities for actual um, deliberation, uh, opportunities for contestation. So there needs to be an actual contest and the sorts of mechanisms in place to allow for this contestation. Equality of participation. So we need, know that everyone needs to be able to participate and not just kind of, okay, you can participate, but that there are actually mechanisms in place to facilitate the participation, especially of underrepresented groups. We know that the management of elections needs to be high quality. 
um, that all of those nuts and bolts of running an election are, are key to um, the technical competence of an election. And then finally, that there be some certainty about the rules of the game and how elections are going to be run. Um, and we saw some of that during the COVID-19 pandemic as being um, one of those big questions uh, where there was some uncertainty about how to, how to respond to this new environment. And so these principles are what really underpin our definition of electoral integrity. And then we can measure this in a variety of different ways. Um, there's obviously public perceptions data, so public opinion data. Um, thanks to Pippa Norris, there's been a, a battery in the world's values survey for a, a few waves now. We also do a lot of collaboration with national level surveys, um, election studies within countries, and uh, experimental work with our own uh, research and public opinion of our elections. We do expert perceptions. So this is of course the PEI index, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we look at how electoral officials uh, believe elections are run and really getting that high quality, rich grassroots understanding um, of electoral integrity through surveys, for example, of election management bodies looking at the legal aspects of election, um, but then also kind of the procedures that happen in practice and trying to measure those. And then oftentimes case studies are really useful and rich. And we'll talk in a second about the COVID-19 project that Toby uh, was leading up alongside IDEA um, and, uh, and other colleagues um, to get some, uh, some real time data on, on how we should run elections during COVID-19. But of course, today we're gonna to talk about the new release, which is fresh off the presses, um, looking at the Perceptions of Electoral Integrity Index 8.0, the newest release. As many of you know, this is a survey of primarily academic experts. Um, it includes questions that we give to these experts um, on an 11 stage electoral cycle, uh, plus an aggregate PEI index that is um, an aggregation of the responses to each of these sub subsections, as you can see. Um, we're very excited that data from 2019 to 2021 was just released. Um, this is added to the existing 2012 to 2018 data set. So now we have about 10 years of uh, PEI data that we're able to take a look at. Um, I've added the, the link there, but probably you can Google it and you'll be able to find um, it's on the Harvard Dataverse for anyone to access and download. Um, so I wanted to give some highlights from what we found in the most recent um, iteration of these data. So we're reporting here the most recent election. Now that we have 10 years of data, country means maybe are, are not quite the, the best way to go about it. So instead we're, we're reporting largely that you'll see today based on the most recent election. Um, so these are the aggregate PEI indexes. You can see some of the same regional trends that we've noticed uh, in recent years. The Nordic region coming out on top with very high quality elections. Uh, followed by many Western European countries. Uh, in the Americas, we noticed Can Canadian elections, um, very well rated by experts, but also contests in some middle income countries like Costa Rica and Uruguay have, have quite high quality elections as well. Uh, we noticed some, some changes in uh, Central and Eastern Europe with some countries uh, coming up very high, uh, like Estonia, Lithuania, and Slovenia. Um, but then other uh, Eurasian countries having elections with, with some pretty serious flaws that need to be uh, studied. Um, we also note some changes uh, in Middle East and North Africa, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that when we talk about some of the major changes that we've seen in this 10 years of data. Um, and there, you know, it's really hard to say what are the major reasons for these trends. You'll see that we have a paper, Toby and I, um, later on in the, in the program where we really are trying to dig into these overtime trends. Um, in electoral integrity, but thankfully with 10 years of data, we can start to do that. Of course, we also look at stages of the electoral cycle. And um, what we notice is that um, once again, campaign finance is that area that by far has the lowest scores of any stage of the electoral cycle when you look across, across the world. Um, so campaign finance for us is things like equitable access to public subsidies and political donations, um, the, the influence of wealthy donors and wealth in politics, um, the publishing of transparent accounts, the proper use of state resources. Um, and again, finance is that one area, the area of money in politics that uh, really hasn't been quite um, adequately addressed quite yet. Uh, we noticed that the, the lowest indicator in all of our battery of questions is this area of the publishing of, of 
fi uh, transparent financial accounts um, and really having a reporting mechanism so that there is transparency in the use of money in politics. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, the highest ranking election on the campaign finance dimension was actually Canada's 2021 parliamentary elections. Um, I am here in Canada and I think I just saw somebody from Elections Canada move in. So um, part of this could be part of the strict contribution limits and very transparent reporting procedures, uh, which are all published online. Um, and so uh, there are some really high quality cases for, for campaign finance that we can all learn from um, and um, how, we can, how we can improve the quality of, of elections, looking at the way that money is used in politics. With 10 years of data, we can also take a look at um, how things have changed. Uh, and one thing being that, that actually surprised us is that not a lot has changed. So it's, it's on a 100 point scale. And you'll notice that, that the aggregate changes are really just kind of between four points either way. Um, and so we know that it's not necessarily an aggregate story of change over these past 10 years. Um, we've some, seen some increases, a lot of decreases, unfortunately. Um, but that are mainly that the PI indexes remain pretty stable over the course of, of the, the last 10 years of data. We can also look at changes within countries. Uh, many countries we have you now multiple data, data points. Um, we see some high dramatic drops, especially in cases where countries have really changed the way they run elections. Um, we look at the example of Hormos where um, there is a change in the presidential mandate and the power balance system that really did end up um, leading to, in some way at least, such a, such a stark decline in electoral integrity. Um, there's also increases. Uh, for example, in Ethiopia and Bulgaria, we do see some of the biggest increases in electoral integrity from the first election study to the last election study. Um, and I really think that um, digging into some of these case studies is something that we'd like to do more of and we hope that you will perhaps participate in to understand uh, how things have changed over time. What are we watching from the last three years, especially, um, and what are we watching moving forward? Of course, the first thing to say is COVID-19 has has impacted elections. Um, our 2020 to 2021 rotating battery includes questions specifically looking at emergency conditions. And stay tuned later on in the week, uh, myself and Toby James and will be presenting the results of that rotating battery to best understand how COVID really impacted elections. But if you don't want to wait, there are, as I mentioned, a number of case studies available. Um, that were, were done in collaboration with the EIP and, um, sorry, that was my phone, um, which is a collaboration with the EIP, um, UEA, um, the um, ESRC, International IDA, Newcastle University, et cetera. Um, so all of these organizations came together to commission some case studies to really understand what has gone on um, in, in, during the COVID-19 pandemic and how that has influenced elections. Uh, we're also looking at issues relating to the information environment. I think the cybersecurity issue is one that I found very interesting and increasingly um, looking largely at cyber threats more broadly. Um, we notice in the 2018-2019 uh, rotating battery that the issue isn't necessarily uh, with actual hacking or the security of, of, of the actual technology. It's about the information environment and how that has changed thanks to social media or no thanks to social media. Um, and how that's influenced the, the journalistic environment, how that's influenced the type of discourse and news that people are accessing. Um, and so we're, we're really watching this information environment and how, um, how we know about uh, elections, how, how this public deliberation is happening now thanks to some of the new technologies that are involved that really aren't that new anymore but seem to be evolving at such a rapid pace. And the last thing we'd be remiss not to mention is that we are watching what's going on in the United States. A lot of uh, press attention and public attention has been on the situation in the United States and um, we do have five elections that now have been covered. We noticed some of the greatest decreases looking at the um, results section and the acceptance of results and that perhaps being one of the new frontiers in terms of electoral um, malpractice is, is refusing to accept results. And we're seeing that now in, in established democracies like the American case. Um, and so 
I'll plug the September workshop that's coming up that will be hopefully in person in Montreal, um, which is going to focus entirely on this question of American elections and whether we see a decline in electoral integrity. Our preliminary data doesn't show an overall aggregate decline. There are actually some areas that are improving, that some states are, are finding really interesting ways of um, improving the delivery of elections in terms of electoral management. But at the same time, we see some of the, the rhetoric really eroding um, trust in American elections and that being one, one key area that we'll be paying attention to. So um, now it's your turn to use the PEI data. Um, we would really love it for these data to be used uh, to, to inspire debates on national election law and policy. I know in the Canadian context, I've been asked um, for a variety of um, organizations and individuals to show, okay, how has Canada changed over time? And also, um, where are we kind of lagging? We, even though in Canada, we tend to think we have pretty high quality elections, there are some areas where, where we are lagging. Um, and that's always something that I like to show is, okay, here's how Canada kind of compares to the, the, the global trends. And so you could do that within your own country um, and also dig down into specific questions and see where some of those, um, some of those weaknesses are uh, because every country has some weakness somewhere and uh, elections can continue to be improved. Um, for researchers, uh, we now have cross-national and time series uh, data available. Um, it's 10 years, but it's a, it's a good start and it goes by election. So you can track election to election rather than just kind of broadly year to year. And, and that's something that um, I hope more people will start to do as these PEI data um, continue to add more years of elections and, and you can see things change over time. And we also encourage you, you can download the data and aggregate and disaggregate by election uh, expert country um, and really think through how, how electoral integrity should be uh, defined and how you might choose to aggregate or how you might choose to use specific questions um, in your own research. Uh, so the data are all available for download and we hope that you will use them in your research, in your public debate, in your advocacy work, in whatever you happen to be doing, um, whatever background you have. Um, so obviously, uh, here's how you get in touch with us. If you're at this workshop, though, you probably already know how to get in touch with us. Um, visit our website and um, take a look at some of our recent publications. And we really look forward to this uh, week being an opportunity to dig down deeper into some of these questions started today and to really engage with our practitioner partners as well um, in their work and how we as scholars might be able to contribute to that. So I'll pass it back to Toby um, to continue the. Um, the, the the workshop thanks brilliant thank you so much holly um that's fantastic um and so without further ado we'll go to our our next panelists so massimo tomasolo uh, is very much um at the nexus of both academia and practice very much embodies what the, what um the electoral integrity project is around is about He's a policy specialist with extensive experience in democracy building, democratic governance, social development, evaluation, and aid effectiveness. Um, he's responsible for developing, enhancing, and strengthening strategic relationships uh, between international idea and uh, stakeholders at the UN General Assembly. So very much in the fore um, of much of the international work that's been undertaken. But also has worked with many other organizations such as the OECD, UNESCO, um, and, and so on. He's a scholar as well. Uh, so he's previously been a visiting scholar at Lewis University in, in Rome. Uh, he's lectured at the Colin Powell uh, School for Civic and Global Leadership at the City College of New York. Um, and has authored seven books, the most recent of which uh, was Democracy and the Pillars of UN Work. So um, very much our, our welcome to, to Massimo and the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Toby, and thank you, uh, holly -Ann. and uh, also many thanks to Sanson, who will uh, speak after me. I'm very honored to have been invited uh, today. Uh, and of course, on behalf of International Idea, I welcome uh, this opportunity. And we are, as you know, uh, a partner in this initiative. So we really value the work uh, and the uh, uh, value added that you bring to this uh, conversation from the academic point of view, but also bridging, bridging the, the gap between uh, uh, 
research policy oriented research and uh, and practitioners on one hand and policy makers on the other uh, i will start uh, uh, with uh, just uh, a very brief introdu introduction on the notion of uh, backsliding because you are going to address electoral backsliding uh, and we uh, do have in our data at the international idea through the global state of democracy indices uh, some indications of uh, where we stand on democratic uh, backsliding, which are drawn uh, from our latest iteration of the global state of democracy indices. And I will uh, give you just uh, the short story, but I will start by saying that uh, the notion of democratic backsliding that we use is a gradual decline in checks on government and civil liberties over a period of five uh, years. And uh, these uh, data that are uh, going to be launched uh, shortly, actually this week for the uh, data of 2021, indicate uh, that uh, there is a, a confirmation in the number of uh, the uh, largest democratic uh, declines and uh, also in the number of uh, democracies that our backsliding. I will try to share the presentation just to give you an idea. And I hope you can see my, let me see if I, yeah, I didn't click on share. Now I will do it. Can you see the presentation? The, Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, after all these months and years, I haven't become so proficient. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, this pandemic is, is leaving a mark on, on our lives. So this is the, the largest democratic declines from 2011 to 2021, according to the definition that I gave you. And as you all know, probably we have a, a global state of democracy indices that is based on five main attributes and uh, some attributes also capture some of the elements that you are also measuring. So I would say that the, this is part of the picture, the overall picture that you can have by not, not only looking at uh, the electoral backsliding, but also other uh, dimensions of backsliding. And uh, this is the situation uh, in 2021 of these countries, Poland, Slovenia, Brazil, and Hungary are currently backsliding, while Turkey, Nicaragua, Serbia, and Benin have experienced the democratic uh, uh, breakdown. And uh, here uh, you have the list of uh, backsliding democracies from our previous uh, uh, report, uh, the one based on data on 2020 and uh, in 2021. Uh, basically all the uh, backsliding democracies are from 2020 are still there, uh, but we have two uh, new entries, which are Sri Lanka and El Salvador. But uh, this is just to set uh, the tone on uh, the uh, notion of best gliding, uh, also in, in relation to what I want to address uh, more specifically, which is uh, the uh, work uh, that we are carrying out uh, together with a number of other uh, international organizations in the so-called Global Democracy Coalition. This is a process that we started uh, in support of the uh, other major governmental process uh, that you just mentioned, uh, Toby, the Summit uh, for Democracy. The first Summit for Democracy, which was convened by uh, the uh, US administration, uh, took place in December 2021. It was a, uh, an online uh, event and it, it is part of a process that will lead to another uh, summit. Uh, we could call it the second summit, but in, in fact, the whole process between this first online uh, summit and the next summit uh, 
uh, that will be held uh, hopefully in person uh, should be considered as part of this endeavor. And uh, it includes also what has been called a year of action. Uh, the rationale behind it is that uh, the U.S. administration convened the summit to, to bring together leaders from governments, representatives of the European Union and uh, the UN, and uh, with some involvement of civil society and the private sector through some parallel sessions, uh, in order to uh, set out uh, sort of an affirmative agenda for democratic renewal. And uh, initially it was uh, meant uh, to last a year, as I said, but probably this second event, the one in person, is going to take place uh, in uh, the first half of 2023. So it will be slightly uh, more than uh, a year. We at International IDEA identified this as a, a strategic opportunity to place uh, democracy at the front and center of the global uh, agenda. And uh, indeed, uh, um, when uh, the uh, war in uh, Ukraine, the war of aggression by Russia in Ukraine, uh, started uh, after years of low intensity conflict following uh, the Crimea annexation by Russia, uh, all of this is uh, actually uh, stressed even more in international policy agendas. The notion uh, of the importance of uh, democracy as a, an element that may also contribute uh, to peace, to peace uh, building and to peace uh, making. Uh, what uh, did we do? Uh, well, uh, I just mentioned this uh, Gl Global Democracy Coalition. It was created in order to organize a forum that took place just a week before the summit in December. And the forum was um, attended by uh, some 52 democracy organizations from uh, around the world. And we had uh, um, a series of events uh, that lasted uh, around the clock for more than 24 hours, uh, and uh, which uh, saw uh, interventions by 250, uh, about 250 speakers from over 50 countries. Uh, all these uh, events uh, were summarized in a report that we uh, then submitted on behalf of the Global Democracy Coalition to the Summit for uh, Democracy uh, the following uh, week. We also produced the policy brief on the challenges of democracy, as well as uh, views and priorities of civil society. And more recently, a statement on the value and importance of the summit, which was signed uh, by uh, 29 of international idea member states. We have uh, 34 member states in total. And uh, the uh, work that we did also on the summit in support uh, of the Summit for Democracy was also carried out with uh, the funding of the European Union. We created uh, different resources. One of these is what I'm showing now, it's a portal, uh, a news and resource portal for the Summit for Democracy, which uh, gives you uh, the opportunity to explore the commitment uh, taken by uh, member states who took the floor at the Summit for Democracy or submitted written uh, commitments after the uh, December 2021 uh, summit. There is a dashboard with, uh, which provides you with an overview of the commitments. Uh, we also, um, here is on the, on the left, uh, the report uh, with the recommendations to the Summit for Democracy that emerged from the Global Democracy Forum. Also, we produced an analysis of the uh, Summit for Democracy commitments. This is the other report on the right uh, uh, hand side of the slide, unpacking the Summit for Democracy commitment, uh, which uh, listed the, the various commitments uh, by clustering them uh, in terms of their focus or whether they were only uh, limited to international uh, democracy assistance uh, support or also to internal uh, policy agendas in, uh, in the countries that took uh, commitments. 
And um, I will provide you with some uh, indications of how these commitments look like in the field of elections, which is the main, uh, probably the most important background for your uh, deliberations in these uh, uh, coming days. So here is a table taken from uh, that report that maps out commitments on elections. You have the focus of commitments uh, on different elements uh, highlighted by member states. And uh, we uh, broke down these uh, between efforts at home and efforts abroad, the democracy uh, assistance agenda, so to speak, at the, and the internal uh, democracy building uh, agenda. As you can see, the focus of commitments uh, uh, covers uh, many important areas of the uh, electoral integrity project uh, uh, analytical framework. Uh, well, holding elections on uh, schedule, uh, strengthening capacity for electoral processes, including strengthening the electoral commissions, uh, protecting electoral integrity through combating disinformation and electoral interference and other means. Um, there is a cluster on voting that pulls together voting age, voter registry, voter education and rights, electoral reform issues, creation of uh, an EMB, an electoral management body, and election uh, observation. Well, uh, if we uh, want to have uh, a better understanding of uh, what does this imply, let's look at the uh, number of uh, countries that attended the Summit for Democracy, 110 plus the United States. Uh, out of these 110, 98 made an official statement. And uh, then turning these into commitments, uh, 59 countries submitted written commitments. Out of them, 49 provided commitments themselves, written commitments, and 10 uh, had the US State Department turn their verbal commitments into written commitments. So when we are talking of mapping commitments on elections, we are not talking of the 98 uh, countries that uh, made uh, a statement at the summit, but we're talking of these commitments out of the 59 countries uh, that eventually uh, submitted the written commitments. Uh, in general, uh, the uh, countries, uh, all uh, but seven of them committed to strengthening uh, democracy domestically, uh, while 43 countries committed to strengthening democracy abroad and 36 committed to both. Uh, fighting corruption was a key priority. Um, in, uh, a, in the African uh, region, actually there was a, a strong focus on um, electoral processes, uh, which dominated their commitments. You can see it also from these, uh, uh, from these uh, uh, table. Uh, these, uh, well, ranged uh, from the DRC on uh, holding elections on schedule to strengthening the capacity of electoral commission in Zambia, increasing female representation in Liberia, and respecting court independence and judgments in resolving electoral disputes in uh, Malawi. In Asia and the Pacific, the focus was more on enhancing transparency, strengthening civil and political liberties, and fighting uh, disinformation. European commitments focus to a larger extent on enhancing transparency, protecting media freedom, and strengthening gender and social group equality with a strong focus on combating racism and anti-Semitism. And uh, in the Americas, the priority focus was on strengthening social group equality and strengthening civil and political uh, liberties. What were the, the areas where less commitments uh, attracted the uh, interest by uh, member states who, who, who took commitments uh, after the uh, summit? Well, domestically, uh, the lowest priority issues were local democracy, political parties, direct democracy and parliaments. Uh, and uh, there was uh, some interest, but not so broadly uh, uh, distributed with the number of uh, European countries uh, that make commitment on democracy education in schools, so uh, civic education. Uh, 
Now, I would like to conclude because the, the ring that you heard was my, my own alarm uh, by saying a couple of things. Uh, we uh, think that uh, the summit process uh, provided a great opportunity, but uh, had also some weaknesses. And I hope that in the year of action, some of these weaknesses will be addressed. One of the main weaknesses has been the voice of the main interlocutors that uh, should have been uh, heard in the context of the summit. And I'm talking particularly of um, uh, civil society organizations. And there should also be a broader and deeper uh, engagement of uh, countries and regions from around the world. Uh, there is a limited role that international organizations, uh, regional organizations may play. We know that now geopolitics is back. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the war on, uh, against Ukraine is actually confirming that uh, realpolitik is back in international relations. But we do need to hear voices from civil society and from the global south in a way that may influence policy making at the next summit. And we are trying to favor that through the global uh, democracy coalition and through the extended network that we have, we have created. And we are bringing to the table also the analysis that we produce through our uh, global uh, state of democracy indices and also the analysis that you carry out on electoral integrity. Thank you very much, Tobu. Thank you so much, Massimo. Um, such excellent analysis and we're really uh, we're very grateful for that. So as you can see, um, democracy promotion uh, can very much come from above, if you like, the international community, international organizations uh, working together to push for commitments from, from national governments. But they can also come from the gr grassroots as well and pressures within countries that can be very, very important in terms of bringing about uh, improvements in electoral integrity and protecting electoral integrity. And therefore, we're really delighted to have Sam Samothudo join us um, who is a community organizer from uh, Nigeria and executive director of Uyaga Africa. And this is a civic organization whose mission is to improve democracy in Africa. And over the last decade, Samson has worked to promote not just electoral integrity, but also constitutional and electoral reforms to, fac to facilitate the inclusion of young people in politics. And one of his most significant achievements was actually to be to successfully campaign for the hashtag not too young to run campaign, which lowered the minimum age for elective office in Nigeria, which is really very um, inspiring. Samson, though, also is very much, um, you know, I think it may be an academic in heart. He holds graduate and postgraduate degrees in law and has recently completed his master's uh, at the University of Oxford on the back of very prestigious scholarships. So um, with no further ado, thank you so much, Samson, for, for joining us. Uh, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks, um, Toby. Just confirm you can hear me. All clear, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, um, Toby and Holly, um, for inviting me to speak this afternoon. And, and also thanks, Massimo. Massimo and I all belong to International Idea. Uh, I'm really glad that um, both of us are able to speak um, at this opening panel. So, um, but thanks for that um, presentation. Um, talking about commitments. As you know, Massimo, it's, it's easier to make commitments than to fulfill them. So um, when you talked about you know, meeting and fulfilling those commitments and the role of civil society, I say, what a perfect way to pivot into um, my presentation. Well, I'm so delighted to be here. Toby has asked me to respond to four key questions. First, he's asked me to talk about the IGA Africa and what we do and then also look at a case study around democratic reform or electoral reforms and look at what we did, what worked and what didn't work and what sort of advice and key lessons can we share. And I'm going to try within 15 minutes, you know, to respond to Toby's question. Quite a Herculean task, but I hope I can achieve that. But to say that from a standpoint, um, YAG Africa is a civic organization um, that works um, on democracy across Africa. 
Um, we've got three program areas. First is elections. Um, the second is legislative engagement. Um, the third is governance and development. Um, we've got um, program presence um, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Liberia, in Gambia, in Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and also Cote d'Ivoire. These are countries, uh, touch points for our, our programs. Um, and our vision is a people-centered, democratic, and developed Africa. And we do this through the different programs um, that we work on. Um, I will just go straight to talk about, you know, Nigeria and the election landscape for the benefit of those who are, who don't have uh, any information about Nigeria or Nigerian elections, because I want to situate what we did um, within the context of that particular background. Well, Nigeria is a multi-party democracy. We've got 18 registered political parties and we practice a presidential system of government. In terms of electoral design, um, we've got a first past the post system. Um, we've conducted about six consecutive general elections um, and we had one alternation of power um, from um, one political party to another. The estimated population of Nigeria is about 200 million. So far, as of today, we have about 90 million registered voters um, with about 176,000 um, polling stations. In actual fact, Nigeria has the highest number of registered voters um, on the continent of Africa for very um, sort of obvious reasons. And what that tells you is organizing election for such a populous and a large country of this nature comes with its own challenges. Now, Yaga Africa electoral integrity work is structured into four components. The first component is our electoral integrity pillar, which I would speak to for the most part of my presentation. And that pillar is stratified into four. So we conduct pre-election observation, what we call pre-os, we observe the nomination of candidates, uh, party primaries by political parties. On election day, we deploy the parallel vote tabulation, the PVTs, and I'm sure for electoral practitioners, you've heard about PVT. So Yaga Africa conducts the PVTs for Nigeria. So far, we've conducted 11 PVTs, um, one presidential PVT, which we did in 2019. We started deploying PVTs in 2016. And of all the 11 PVTs that we've conducted, we verified results declared by the Electoral Commission in nine. And then we have, we unverified or we didn't verify the results in three um, governorship elections for reasons such as electoral manipulation and election rigging, and then also electoral violence. And the fourth pillar of our electoral integrity program is, the, is our latest um, project, which is the election results analysis dashboard, where we aggregate results uploaded on the Electoral Commission's website. Um, and we tabulate the results, analyze the results, and announce or project those results on a TV station. So far, Yaga Africa has built a citizens' movement of over 20,000 citizens' observers. And we're currently you know, um, extending and providing technical assistance to other civic citizens observer groups in countries like Gambia, in Zambia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. The second pillar of our work is on electoral reform. And that brings me to the key issue for my discussion. You see there's a picture um, projected on the screen. And thanks, um, Toby and the team, for doing this, um, for projecting this. Um, we launched um, a fixed elections NG project, and that fixed elections project seeks to promote electoral reforms and amendments to the Electoral Act. So the case study I'll focus on for the purpose of this presentation is our engagement on the amendment to the Nigeria's Electoral Act. Currently, we have the 2022 um, Electoral Act that was recently signed into law by the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, what did we do? So we developed four strategies for advancing electoral reforms. First was the agenda setting strategy. So we worked closely 
with civil society and citizens group to set the agenda on electoral reforms, because we've got a checkered political history um, of um, flawed elections, and there was need you know, to amend our electoral legal framework. So we had to set the agenda, working with citizens groups to set the agenda for electoral reform. The second strategy was a socialization strategy. Yes, it's not, it's not enough to set an agenda. You also need to educate citizens um, on the need um, and the purpose for reforms and why certain amendments are being proposed in the electoral law. For instance, we needed the legislation that guaranteed financial independence for the electoral commission. We also needed amendments in the electoral act that protects innovations, technological innovations in our electoral law, such as electronic transmission of results, electronic accreditation of voters, and also powers vested on the electoral commission to review you know, results declared under duress or false results. So we needed those amendments in our electoral law, but we needed to socialize the public on the, on the need, the value for this particular amendment. The third strategy was an engagement strategy. We needed to engage with the key decision makers and the parliamentarians in the National Assembly, as well as the executive. So we had that strategy of direct interface between the committees who were responsible for amending the electoral law. So two public hearings, two advocacy meetings were constantly engaging with um, with the members of the National Assembly. And lastly was a monitoring strategy to monitor all the amendments and the commitments, just like Massimo talked about, you know, the role of civil society in monitoring commitments made at the Summit for Democracy. What we also did was to have a monitoring strategy to monitor, you know, the conduct of, um, um, of our politicians and how they were advancing amendments to the Electoral Act. All of this, was driven by a strategic approach. And the first approach that we adopted was any electoral reform agenda must be citizens led and must be citizens driven if you're going to achieve any meaningful um, result. And what we did was to strengthen the demand side of electoral reform by empowering citizens with the information that they required. And so through, this, through that engagement, citizens could assert their power to secure desired reforms to the electoral process. The second was the fact that we adopted a rights-based approach towards electoral reforms. And we we'll talk about the key lessons you know, that we learned. We con conceptualize electoral reforms as um, an attempt or an effort to protect the rights to vote and the rights to be voted for, and also ensure that these rights were upheld and they shaped the conversation with, with um, our, uh, our, elect, um, our politicians in the National Assembly. The third sort of key issue and key lesson was the need for consensus. And consensus building is critical you know, for electoral reforms. And we needed to ensure that we build consensus um, and within key actors. And these actors were democratic institutions like the legislature, like the executive, like the election management body itself, as well as NGOs and professional organizations. One of the mistakes that we often make is to limit our conceptualization of civil society. So we focus on NGOs and we forget that that civil society space comprises of different actors, professional bodies, traditional organizations. They are also critical to the reform process. So we identify these new centers of power and that's what we galvanize collective action to provide the needed oversight, as well as the engagement with, um, with our political actors. The fourth, and perhaps also one key lesson that we learned that um, in facilitating you know, multi-stakeholder engagement, electoral reforms should be prioritized, should be structured as a democratic reform project you know, that advances common goods, social stability, and national development. Often we conceptualize electoral reforms isolatedly um, without situating it within the broader um, democratic reform project. And if elections happen within a context, that context matters a lot in our advancing or an attempt to advance or push for, for electoral reforms. And so these were some of the things that we did. And I, you know, 
just to reflect on one of the key, key lessons uh, where I, I hope to end, was the challenge for, for us was about this transition between collaboration and confrontation. That in electoral reform advocacy, you have to manage this dilemma. At what point do you collaborate and what point do you conf confront legislators? So one of the things that happened in, in the Nigeria's um, electoral reform journey was at a point the National Assembly, a section of, of the National Assembly and part the committee deleted some provisions in the proposed bill that um, protects the legality of electronic transmission of results. Um, it was a heated issue, heated argument. It, in fact, it was a huge controversy in the Nigerian political space because the Senate, uh, which is one chamber of the National Assembly, um, killed or was making attempts to kill that particular proposal. But we got citizens, citizens rose, they spoke about this, and the National Assembly was forced to return that particular um, proposal in, in the bill. But one dilemma we had to grapple with was when we scrutinized the bill and identified some drafting errors and cross-referencing gaps. And we went to the Nigerian public in December last year to expose the gaps in the legislation. And we did so mindful of the fact that previously, the president had declined assent to the electoral bill before the last general elections for a record four times. And one of the reasons he cited was drafting errors. So we were proactive to identify the drafting errors and share that with the Nigerian public. But before we did that, we wrote to the National Assembly. It wasn't well received by the legislators. They thought we were actually on a journey to embarrass the National Assembly. And somehow that confrontation affected you know, the relationship. But for us, we needed to make a determination that there is a good cop, bad cop relationship with legislators. Sometimes you have to confront them. Sometimes you have to collaborate with them. So I, I think that every organization needs to make that determination and the judgment call actually lies in your hands. The second lesson that, that we learned from our engagement um, with this reform process was the power of data and technology. And, and just to focus on data, there were lots of counter narratives um, that we, we had to design to counter some of the arguments about the need for whether Nigeria was prepared to electronically transmit results. This is a country where you had um, in, for about over 110 million Nigerians have phones connected um, to have connected mobile phones. Um, you have over 60 to 70% of polling stations access, have access to 2G technology. Um, but the legislators thought that we weren't ready. And the reason why they were pushing against this was electoral technology would promote electoral transparency. And if there is transparency within the electoral process, politicians can no longer undermine or rig the process. And so they were very comfortable with that particular provision. They pushed against it. And we used data to counter this, this narrative. And so for organizations interested in electoral reform advocacy, I think it's important to leverage data, to leverage technology in advancing reforms. The last point I'd like to make is the value of collaboration and collective action that electoral reform is a product of collective action. And it's important that it's collective action that sets the agenda, collective action that provides oversight on the reform process and collective action that inspires hope on the part of Nigerians. Because if you, on the part of um, the public, if the public don't see any value, if they don't see any hope, there's no way they're going to support any reform process. And so when we build consensus around issues, it's important to put people at the center. And by putting people at the center is to see how we inspire hope that their participation in this process will deliver the results. And that image you see is one of citizens, group, both persons with disability, women and, 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 and citizens alike. Oh no, so I, I said, yeah, collective action um, that one advances you know oversight 
on the reform process is critical. Secondly, collective action that sets the agenda and uh, for electoral reforms. But thirdly, it's the one that builds the strategic capacity that is required. Because in actual fact, and our lesson is, politicians never want to change the rules of the game as long as it doesn't guarantee future electoral victory. And as you know, this is one of the dilemmas of political or democratic reforms. And so if citizens are able to raise the salience of reforms and doing so through individuals and groups that have electoral value to the politicians, doing so over a consistent period, I think we can get the desired reforms that, uh, that is needed. So this is the point that I was trying to make and to say thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to the questions and the engagement. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Samson, for giving such a uh, insightful and inspiring talk. Mm -hmm.